Western Reserve University before coming to Ohio State. Uniquely, Jody was an Albert Schweitzer Fellow during the 2021 academic year. A special note, during Jody's time as a Fellow, she facilitated a virtual discussion with Queer Youth on navigating queer identities in STEM and related fields. Jody has extensive volunteer experiences, ranging from working with high school students as part of the anatomy outreach team, to being a time and scorekeeper during the Buckeye Blitz wheelchair rugby tournament. <laughs> Not many people can say that. Jody was one of the first to participate in the Interprofessional Community Scholars Program. We are here work with an interprofessional team to introduce digital literacy to an older community member. An additional aspect of Jody's volunteer portfolio is Zier's focus on mentoring. Jody has mentored fellow medical students, OSU undergraduate students, as well as many high school students. However, Jody's passions also lie in the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation, where he is a volunteer and staunch advocate for adaptive fitness. Jody's research in medical school began in 2020 as a research assistant associated with the RENS program, which is rehabilitation research experience for medical students sponsored by the American Association of Academic Physiatrists. In Zier's research work, he focused on bicycle, motor vehicle crashes, and their associated injuries. This research resulted in a publication of two different manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals. However, what you'll be hearing about today is Jody's work on barriers to correct pronoun usage. Jody completed this work in collaboration with Dr. Scott Holliday, the Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education. I'd like to finish up by sharing that I have come to know Jody pretty well over the past four years. She is a kind and compassionate individual who cares deeply for others, but especially for Zier's patients. Jody has what appears to be boundless energy and is able to accomplish what Zier puts Zier's mind to. Although obstacles may sometimes get in the way, Jody always has perseverance, consistent perseverance to find a workaround to make things possible. Welcome, Jody. Thank you so much, Dr. Clinton. That was fine. <laughs> um, we have the generic slides from the two grand rounds. Um, this will be uh, recorded and uploaded to their YouTube channel to watch at a later date. Um, and then these are the last two grand rounds for the semester. So, as Dr. Kleinzoff said, I'm Jody. Um, I use these zero pronouns wonderfully done with those, by the way. I'll tell you how to break it down. So, um, you have to say that, but thank you. <laughs> um, it's better. Um, so I'm a fourth year, and I'm very excited to be giving this talk. I've, I've done a couple versions of this. This is not going to be like the full workshop version, since it's messaging grand rounds. I won't pick on you guys too much. Um, just kind of listen to me chat. And if you have questions, please feel free to ask them throughout the way. It's very um, informal structure. The agenda for this, basically, I'm going to go through the research project Dr. Punch I talked about, um, and then some common barriers. Basically, we have found through this research, um, talk about misconceptions about pronoun usage, and then you guys tools and ways to power change within yourselves and then those around you in the hospital setting. 
So to get started, a little bit about me. Um, like I said, I'm from Illinois originally. Um, went to Cleveland for undergrad, and then that's when I came out as non-binary. I didn't publicly come out and use these other pronouns until my senior year of undergrad. Um, I made the decision that I wanted to kind of be fully out um, when I came to med school. Um, got top surgery the summer before starting med school, and then I started hormones um, mid cardio pump. So it's a wild ride in my first year. Um, and why now? With the reason why um, this topic is going through my, I thought like once I came out. As long as I told people, you know, you can ask me questions, you can make mistakes, like it'd be fine. People would ask me how to use my pronouns and it'd be a nice back and forth conversation. It'd be all good. Um, and through my third year, especially with moving rotations every two weeks, I realized like that's just not the case. I would constantly be like, you know, please ask me questions. I'm very open at this point in my life to teaching and talk about it. And people would still not want to ask questions. They wouldn't use my pronouns. It would just be like an unspoken subject. So I was like, hmm, there's something else here going on that's besides giving them the opportunity to ask questions and make mistakes or something else like systemically, socioculturally, that kind of thing. Um, and then of course, research, everyone loves research. So I figured, is this just my experience or is how, and how many people are going the same way? So um, last year I started basically designed a survey and I'll talk about that more to kind of figure out what are, like let's start from the basics. What are the barriers? Are the ones that I'm missing? Are the ones just from my lived experience from medical students and physicians across Columbus? I have this soccer ball here because I've come up with a metaphor that I like to use. Anybody play soccer in here? Um, okay, so you can't answer this question. <laughs> um, but let's say I had a soccer ball and I just juggled like 10 times on my feet, right? You watched me do it and I threw the soccer ball at you and it's time for you to juggle now too. Like how many of you think you could do that? Like just from watching me, right? It's kind of hard, right? Like, so I wouldn't expect you to do that, but people think about pronouns the same way. If I tell you how to use my pronouns, I might even say a few sentences and teach you. And then people think, oh man, I have to now be perfect at them. And then they're afraid of making mistakes so they won't say anything. But if I use this analogy, you'd be like, you just need practice. Like people are able to understand it a lot better. You also need a place without maybe like lamps or lights on the break. Um, so like creating a safe atmosphere that you can make mistakes and practice this stuff. Um, kind of this one thing that I just realized like to have these kind of conversations is like a great start to be better like active allies as opposed to like, passive allies. So, <clears throat> but, um, sorry. Um, so yeah, this is basically the research study that we did. My face. Um, but basically we had uh, 928 people fill out the survey, which is blew out of the park what we expected, to, to be honest. Um, 763 of those were eligible, which means that they were med student or physician practicing in the Columbus or surrounding um, counties. Um, and then we also had some 10 point liquor scales, which now like I've done some more analysis and stuff, so I'll have a couple of tables for that. Um, essentially asking people, do you think you're good at using pronouns for your patients? Do you think you're better at your colleagues than using pronouns for your patients? And do you think your colleagues are good at using uh, pronouns for your patients and co coworkers? Because there's a difference too. And this is just a pilot study. There's tons more questions we can have from this. Um, we had basically 60% of those people actually did fill out the response. Because a lot of times we only had one free response, which is in bold there. And we wanted to kind of worry in a way that wasn't attacking. We wanted to be honest. And if they kind of were able to talk about other people, because you'll see like um, people think that they're better than their colleagues. Um, um, and then the majority of people who fill out the free response were uh, older attendings, like five plus years of practice, and then medical students. Um, because, uh, these are a couple of new slides. I'm not going to go into too much detail about it, um, but essentially the average preparedness of or ask, we ask patients, uh, who people like, do you think you're prepared to work with trans non binary patients? The average number was seven, which means like people think there's still it's not a 10, it's not a five, but it's there's room for improvement. Um, and then interestingly, this top diagram basically shows, I don't put the stats in there, but it's significant. Um, and basically people that had prior training but didn't remember what they were taught, essentially, um, had the same level of preparedness, perceived preparedness, as people who had no prior training, which just speaks to the importance of like if you forget what you're taught, it means something. So talking about longitudinal training throughout the years of repetition is super important to kind of maintain this level of efficacy that we want. Um, and the bottom table, basically the one was an, anybody who rated themselves better at using patient pronouns than their colleagues. Um, and then a zero was no different than a negative one was maybe their colleagues are better. So <clears throat> this is not the, this is like, Kind of hard to understand, but basically, if people think that they have a higher preparedness to work with trans and non binary patients, they are going to rate themselves as being better at using their patients' pronouns than their colleagues. But if they think that they have less um, preparedness to work with trans people, but actually think their colleagues are better than them, 
Um, so that's kind of interesting. And it just shows that like training needs to be like helping people feel prepared. The more of you prepared you feel, the better you'll be at using pronouns and more confident you'll feel doing that, doing those actions. Okay, so does anybody want to share pronoun or barriers to like pronoun like usage and make mistakes that like you guys have witnessed? It's okay if you don't want to have more slides, but like if anyone wants to throw out things, like <laughs> Um, something that I've experienced is like general assumptions. If someone's um, presenting as one, you know, gender another, and you make an assumption, and it's like not part of a normal conversation, that you're disclosing or not. Yep, definitely. Yeah. I feel like a lot of times when someone has pronouns that someone may not assume fit their identity, um, a lot of people default to just always using they, even though that's not the pronoun that they actually go by and I think that that's a weird thing that I noticed a lot of people think it's always a safe option for everyone when in fact it's all incorrect just now okay. cool anybody else basically this is what we've developed from this research and the ones that you guys mentioned and so many more are on here that we're going to make it bigger and go through them in more detail but this is like a snapshot of basically all the barriers we found and you'll notice that a lot of them don't have to deal with just like skill and like knowledge. Um, this is basically like it goes beyond like, you know, fears, like morales, that kind of stuff that we don't talk about in trainings at all. Um, so here's a quote from one of the survey respondents that we had, and it's exactly what you talked about with appearances. So many, uh, we'll talk about assumptions and um, basically like, and then medical and societal culture, um, essentially like, I had, like, I had a patient experience where, because um, I think so current trainings basically say, ask everybody their pronouns, you know, share your pronouns first. And the reason why these things don't really work is because everybody knows what they should do. But when you're in the hospital, when nobody else around is doing it, it's hard to do it. I don't ask anybody, everybody what their pronouns are. I don't feel comfortable sharing my pronouns in introductions because I just don't know who I'm going to interact with. So trainings surrounded around conversations that you know, how can you still be a good ally with maybe not doing this all the time um, is basically what I try and kind of bring up these conversations. Um, for instance, and like, and again, like honoring mistakes and we're all learning together, so it's perfect at this. And the more conversation we can have around this, the better. So I had experience in the ED where I was presenting to an attending in front of the patient and they presented this film. And so I let she, her slip is like, I wasn't trying to use pronouns, but then it slips. And then I didn't feel comfortable in the moment stopping in front of the attending, asking what pronouns they prefer and all that stuff. But it really was like, weighing on me so I decided you know after we presented I went back before the end of my shift and I was like hey I'm sorry I use she her pronouns like what pronouns do you prefer then you use me him pronouns and so I was really happy that I went back because then I shared my pronouns we had a little back and forth so even if I don't know how they might have felt in the moment they recognized like I noticed the mistake I came back to talk about it and they were like totally chill they were even happy that I come back and they had this conversation with me and then I was able to send an email to because I work with every attendee different each day. So I just sent them an email saying, hey, you know that last patient we saw, like they actually use these pronouns in case they were still writing their note and just remind them like, you know, this is why it's important because if you just go by appearances, you're using your implicit bias. You're just kind of nitpicking people. You're going to miss so many. Nobody, no trans person looks the same. Um, they could be pre-transitioned. They could decide that they, this is how they present. Gender expression is different than their gender identity. So the assumption that so many times we got a response like, well, I don't know what, what, they can't, they're not telling me what pronouns to use. Like they shouldn't have to. And sometimes people actually do like wear different clothes to kind of create safety as well. Um, so why make it harder by like thinking like a self-assuming when you just ask, you know? And it's like, I'll talk about this later. It's like the way you ask it versus like what you're asking. Because essentially you're just trying to create respect. You're just trying to make sure that you tell them, you um, refer to them the way they want to. Um, Another thing with uh, hospital badges I put on here is like for a visit, like great increasing visibility. I have my badge too, and I think it's helped a little bit. Um, I would say that there's, I think the downside with these is that, again, it's almost like people put it on as a token of allyship and then you're done. And so I've been misgendered by so many people wearing pronoun pins and pronoun badges. And to me, it hurts even more because I, I was like, oh, safe person, cool. And then they don't even ask me my pronouns are, they misgender me. So I'm just like, I think more communication needs to be going around what is the purpose of these badges? They're meant as conversation starters, not like conversation enders. Like, just, I don't have to say my pronouns not because they're here, um, because they're not really for that person. It's like, you know, they're using like binary like, pronouns. Um, and it's meant to be like conversation starters between people and always kind of just starting conversations. Um, 
So basically, um, documentation is the least I have to speak about because it's not my forte with technology, but it is a very common thing that a lot of people brought up of just being like not knowing where to find it, not knowing how to update pronouns in the system. And then just not having documentation in general like smart phrases and stuff. Um, the knowledge category we've like changed a few times. Um, we've added stuff from like the patient care. We like reorganize these things a lot. But one thing I'll just speak on here is that again, current trainings kind of just talk about pronouns and then just say to ask them, ask them. But it's almost like um, like any kind of medical, like taking an allergy history or whatever. Like I think I recently heard someone say, like, you know, you, you get the info, but you don't know what to do with it. Um, so especially people that use non-binary pronouns or neo pronouns, um, that's just one step. Like you have to be able to talk about the person. So you can get their pronouns, but if you still don't know how to use them, like you're gonna not go very far and you're not gonna help kind of make that person visible. So current trainings need to have like practice sheets with pronouns that are using they them pronouns for individual people using easier pronouns and that's the thing too because I use my pronouns different than somebody else uses pronouns and so a big assumption that goes around is that like somebody mentioned um using they them for everybody um I actually had a response that said um well it's offensive to call somebody who uses she her like they them and I'm like that's what trans people happen to us like all the time like because nobody wants to use our pronouns or learn them um so it's kind of this like double standard um but um yeah but yeah, so basically, um, a lot of people talk about like new grammar and stuff. And so again, with that, like more practice at the bottom, like that's the thing. Nobody's expecting you to get the first try. Finding ways and tools to empower somebody to practice these things is how they're gonna get it. I have like really, really good friends I've known for years and I haven't seen them in a long time. I don't expect them to use my pronouns like the first time I see them because it's like habit. And the, and the more you practice it, the more you get more fluent at it and better at it. And it takes practice and it takes like effort like a lot of people don't want to put any effort beyond just like okay i got the pronouns but you're just not going to talk about me the right way um so that's what they, people don't realize too and this is a quote um that kind of encompasses several of those topics um that we talked about and especially like it, i mean it has um the medical culture you know it's really hard and uncomfortable especially as students we're in a place of low hierarchy and you don't want to like ruffle the roof or whatever um so a lot of the times this happens on rounds like you're trying to be more inclusive of patients and then the attendings aren't about it or nurses or i'm not no anybody other med students um and so another um tip and strategy is basically like one-on-one -on -one conversations um again similar to what i did with the patient like if you notice something where overall like the patient getting disgendered in front of rounds um go back afterwards be like, hey, I'm sorry that happened. What would you like me to do in the future? Um, I got a, a tip of advice from a, a colleague who is a trans man, and he actually mentioned that in binary trans culture, if somebody gets misgendered, it's pretty common to be like, correct them, always correct immediately. But with non binary people, if you correct them in public, like you're outing them on, immediately. So it's not the same thing. And so you have to be able to ask them ahead of time, or like if you don't, if you haven't talked to them yet, ask them like if this were to happen what would you prefer i do in that situation some people don't want you to correct them in front of other people or they're not feel safe or something like that so the more you can connect with that person that you feel like is being marginalized and see what can i do to help support you the most you don't have to know what to do um ask in a way that's saying like i want to be respectful of you i want to make sure you feel supported so what can i do to help you in that moment or retroactively if it already happened like that wasn't cool i heard it i saw it um what would you like me to do in the future those can go a long way. And I've had so many experiences where I'll be like in a patient room with my residents, patient generates me as he, my colleagues generate me as she, nobody talks to me about it. I'm just here feeling like invisible. And it's just like, what, what's going on through their mind? So if only somebody, and I've had instances too where I'll get misgendered and then my classmates will come up after me and be like, hey, that was, like, that was, that was not cool. Like, how do you feel about it? And just the act of somebody else recognizing this happened and checking on me is super important. It goes really far and it doesn't happen all enough. So that's something really easy you can do. And again, if you don't feel comfortable, like standing up to attending in front of people, you can pull them aside after and be like, hey, that patient uses these pronouns or stuff like that. Um, other ways that you can kind of still be an active ally without kind of, you know, making yourself feel in an uncomfortable situation. Okay. Um, yeah, so patient care is kind of like what I talked about with like, we tell people to ask everybody their pronouns, but that's not the norm. So I think a lot of trainings also say like, 
Well, if you tell them, because like sometimes people worry about negative patient reactions, and it's true. I actually have been pretty fortunate. Most of my patients have been pretty chill with my pronouns, or they just don't know, and you know, I, it's just they, they like me, so it's fine. Um, but I haven't had any negative flat backlash. Some people will be like, "Well, they're like, oh, how dare you? Like, can't you tell?" Like, and so I think this is a, a point of learning. You know, you're gonna run into patients like that. It's the not the majority, and also you're helping the minority feel. So it's basically you sit down and be like, "I know, like." You feel this way, but there are other patients that actually like this helps kind of make them visible and see. And so, kind of teaching them that this is why they're doing this, and that becomes easier the more you do it. Um, so, right now, we can't say we ask all of this of our patients because we don't. Um, and so, starting that kind of, but we're not in a culture that's ready to do that yet. So, again, finding unique ways to do it. And I'll like mention a couple other points too. And for me, like the, again, like, so similar to what I've been talking about, like the most um, interesting category that we haven't really talked about in prior trainings is just like, you know, these like behavioral, psychosocial, like mental uh, games of this, like fear. Some of you are, are afraid of making a mistake, um, are afraid of messing up. Um, and we don't talk about these things. We just say to do it. And if they are given the, if they are told to do something, but they don't know how to do it, then they're not going to do it. And so there's this huge gap that basically new trainings need to kind of work towards in creating this power, power and change. Um, the next, um, I guess I'll just say, yeah, no, that's fine. Uh, I'll put this quote up there because it kind of talks again about a few things. Um, and like we are basically, we have this habit that we need to retrain ourselves in. And I'll just give another anecdote um, of when I was on a week on rotation, one of the patients had a door on the sign of no males lab. And it's always an awkward thing for me because I'm just like, I, some patients see me as female, some see me as male. So I just kind of like, I just go in and I raise my voice a little bit higher and I just say, hi. Um, she was cool with it. She gave me a cookie. It was great. It was a good time. And then the nurse I overheard behind me trying to basically pull the residents out being like, hey, be in here. And like, I, didn't, I couldn't hear everything they were saying as much as I tried to find my ears. Um, but the resident really wasn't sure what to say either. And then we all left the room and we just kind of kept walking down the hall and I pretended like I didn't hear whatever went on. None of them again addressed me like myself to ask me like how I identify or like, if you have a problem with this, talk to me about it, not somebody else. Um, and then, um, I think, um, yeah, I forgot, there was another way I forgot, to put. but yeah, like essentially like, again, oh, um, like as a trans person, like a lot of times I'll get to this too, but like people, they make a mistake, they'll kind of like stop talking and they'll think that I didn't hear it. It's like, I always hear it. We will always, we, like, we are primed ever since coming out. Like I know every pronoun like that one uses for me, um, unless I truly am not even engaged in the conversation. Um, so that's like a really important thing. This happened during my AMR 16 days in this room. And I'm oh really God. worried this is going to happen. Oh it's a room. I know. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah. So all these things. These are like the summary slides of like things you can do or basically just knowing misconceptions that you might have heard already. And what we've seen in a lot of people that the message that we've been thinking we're telling people is that like it's okay to ask like we want you to ask for these pronouns like it helps you show that you're validating our identities you care about us and yet so many physicians are just saying i don't want to offend somebody so that's like a, just a message that we need to keep working on but being like oh as long as you're asking in a respect that's the thing how you ask the question like in a respectful manner like nobody's going to hate you for asking like how do you want to respect them right um and all the off if you can get somebody like that like you're doing the best you can do can't change everybody um, so this is just like the best thing to do. Uh, and then making a mistake is not a reflection of your moral character. Everything takes practice. Um, you're actually being a better ally. Making, I mean, and I, I speak for myself, not for all trans people, and take advantage, like I am someone who's willing to teach. And so that's why I'm doing this too. The more you can learn from someone who is willing to, I shouldn't have to like beg you to ask questions. If I'm already asking you to ask questions, like just ask me um, to the endless extent, um, because that way you meet somebody that doesn't want to teach you and they just want to tell your pronouns and move on. You have a little bit more baseline knowledge that you can take with you and then talk about it with somebody else, practice it, and then not put the pressure on them. Um, like I mentioned before, like silence is worse than using the wrong pronoun. It's amazing how how little you can say about somebody without pronouns. Uh, some people in the, in the um, survey said like, well, I just decide not to use pronouns at all. Like, I like to hear them talk for five minutes because it's really hard. Um, and there's going to be something slipped in there. Um, so that is like, that's not true. And it's not actually like being a good ally because, and like once somebody mentioned with like, 
using they versus she. I get a lot of the times people think because I'm non-binary and I use these pronouns, like, oh, I'll get your Chinese they down with it too. No, that's not the case for me. If I had she touch they, then yeah, maybe, but not like I don't do that. Um, and some people do. So again, everybody uses their pronouns differently. And so just because you know one set of pronouns and how someone uses it, always confirm and correct. Um, and because you never know, they might use some of those uh, grammars a little bit differently. Um, and I wouldn't even feel comfortable speaking about like A, M, airs and Zs and Zers because like, I don't use those pronouns. <laughs> um, and then uh, basically also, like, like I mentioned, one-on-one -on -one conversations work really well. Um, it doesn't put people on the spot. Um, in the society of medicine, nobody likes to be wrong. Um, and so it can be very, very easy to get defensive. And so the, the best thing you can do is to have these conversations in a way that like is open and like not attacking, um, which is unfortunate because I mean, these things aren't cool. Like we shouldn't have to be so gentle with people. But in my eyes, I have found that it goes a lot farther to be more patient, open-minded, you know, then just come at it with like, you need to be better. Um, one example is my senior resident when I was on my gem at certain service, did like the after two days, like what are your expectations for the rotation? And I actually, sometimes I get bold, sometimes I don't. This time I got a little bold, I guess. And I was like, at the end, do you have any questions for me? Cause he had already misgendered me once in the rotation. And he was like, no. And I was like, wrong answer. And I was like, I use these pronouns. And do you have any questions about them? And he didn't ask me any questions. His face immediately got red and he like looked like a little animal with his tail between his legs. And that's not the reaction I want. You know, I want to have an open, comfortable conversation. And I've met people that I have the same conversation. With. Um, but yeah, so like basically like the point of that is um one, like I want it to be something that's like it's okay to talk about. Um, it's not walking on eggshells. It's nothing that like, it's like, again, cause like if he didn't actually end up using my pronouns for the rest of anyways, but it's like, you know, at least it's something like he can think about. Um, and then the other point with that is I told him that you're the senior resident. If you start using my pronouns, the other interns and the other med students are going to use my pronouns. Like seniority helps a lot. And I've seen it happen is when one person starts using it fluently, everybody picks up a lot. So it was a shame that he didn't do it in the moment, but I hope he thinks about it. Um, and then I've already mentioned how many times practice is important. So this is a good slide because it kind of, again, is another summary slide, but this is a little bit more like proactive tools you can use. Um, basically, I had an attending on my family med uh, rotation actually teach me something. And he asked me, how would, how, would I, how would I like to be addressed with patients? And I like that language because I definitely agree sometimes when you say, what are your pronouns? Like you can feel kind of putting somebody on the spot you know, like the pronouns just so become like a trigger word or whatever. And I was like, I'm sorry. So this is great because patients who are, I mean, uh, med students or residents who are not trans hear that question and they might say, oh, student doctor, blah, 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 is fine. Or, you know, doctor, blah, 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 is fine. So they won't even talk about pronouns because it's not on their mind. But me, I heard that question. I was like, oh, and he might not have even been expected to hear my pronouns. But I was like, oh, well, I use these are pronouns and you can, I mean, student doctor, no, he's fine. Um, and so it was funny because then when we went into the room, he started using he him pronouns for me. I was like, interesting. And then we came back out and it took a little bit. Finally, he was like, wait. And he was like, um, so, and then he actually thought that it's easier because that's the thing I learned, have to learn about what people's baseline knowledge of Zier and non-binary gender neutral pronouns are. And he thought like a Z was the he form and like Zier was the she form and just, I was like, whoa. And I was like, they're just their own separate like gender neutral <laughs> pronouns. So it was just like, little mind blown for him and but I appreciate the conversation it was chill he never got red in the face he was older too so people can learn at all ages like there's the stereotype that like you know the older you are you're like gone it's like nah. my aunt can use my pronouns better than my mom and she's 12 years older than her so yeah um and so I really like this because then it kind of takes away the pressure people can say what they want to say and again you're just kind of asking a basic question of how would you like to be addressed um, you can introduce your pronouns first with patients if you want. Um, I think, I think, yeah, the first time I was actually finally able to like advocate for people because I'm like, I hate correcting people for myself. But like when I was on my peace rotation, we had some trans patients and like attending these nurses and misgendering them. And I just, every time just, like, just say the correct pronouns, just after it. Or like in a patient room, like as long as like, uh, I think we knew this patient was out to their family because that's a whole other discussion too that we don't talk about in training. Like what do you do in that situation? Um, basically, the, the, I think the mom used 
the wrong pronouns. And then I said a sentence after using the right pronouns. So it's not like I even have to come converse with the mother or say anything like attacking. I'm just letting the patient know that you are heard and you're visible. And so making that active effort, even if I didn't have to say anything, I'm gonna find a sentence to say with the pronouns. So it's kind of like visible and feels like they're not alone. Um, this is important, apologizing and correcting. <clears throat> and again, everybody knows the basics of like correct, apologize, move on. Don't dwell on it, it's fine. But the, but the reason why correcting is important as opposed to just like, you know you messed up but then you, you don't say anything and you just kind of move on, is that for me, I don't know if you, if you messed up because you, or if you didn't even try, are you forgetting? Do you not want to try it? Do you not know how to try it? So, because sometimes people might try and correct themselves, but they'll use the wrong, the wrong form of the pronoun. So it gives me an opportunity to teach them, like, actually, I would use this in that situation. This is how you would do it. So every time you correct yourself, again, it's meant, I love it because I'm like, yes, you're trying, like, great, we're making progress. And it's better than doing, like, not saying anything. Um, and that helps me to see where you're at in the process. Um, but again, not everybody's going to want to teach. So it's, again, I think coming at it with an approach of respect, being like, where are you at? Can I ask you these questions if I have questions? And they might say no, and you go find somebody else to practice and with and find you Google. Um, but, you know, if they're willing to teach, then take advantage because that makes things a little easier. Um, and like I said, it's not fast. It's how you ask it. Communication is really important. Like I mentioned before, these conversations can make people like, be like, nah, nah, don't talk to me. Like, I don't know, I don't know what I'm doing. Um, and then you don't get anywhere. So really kind of empowering, like, comfort. And it's interesting because, I mean, there's so many questions I want to ask, like, people, like, after this basic research. But essentially creating safe places that you can um, practice. Because sometimes I feel like people might be more comfortable practicing and getting it wrong with, like, other cis um, colleagues than, like, me. Um, just because they think, like, oh, I'm going to look so stupid or I don't know what to do. So creating those networks of people being like, hey, I just met someone that uses these pronouns. Can we practice it together? We don't have these conversations. Trainings don't tell you to do this stuff. But again, the practice is where you get better at it. Um, and so that's, like, what you need to create around you. Um, and holding yourselves and each other accountable. So many times, again, like, you know, you witness it, you don't correct anything. It doesn't have to be in the moment and the whole big thing. It can be like in one-on-one -on, -one, on the side, then you talk to the other person, like, how, how are you doing with that? Um, and then tools. So if you don't have even a person to talk to you about it, I actually had a friend when they came out and used they, them pronouns, like seven, like eight years ago, like it wasn't as even common back then. They like labeled a household object in their home and said that they were going to use they, them pronouns. Because I actually, for a while, I think a lot of my friends, some of my friends, not a lot of them, I don't know that many friends. <laughs> um, that's not um, they use my pronouns better than I do. So sometimes I'll like talk to myself and like every now and then when I have to use my pronoun, I'm like, which form of it? Like I can teach them really well, but fluently I don't practice them. So I tell people that to say like, hey, this is how normal it is. And so the more you can actually speak sentences uh, more frequently, the more it will become less of a thinking. Because when I first came out, I for a sec was like, I don't think I like this at all because nobody could use my, my pronouns like in a sentence. And I was like, this is like awkward and like it was just bad everyone was thinking a lot and but when one person started using fluently I'm like oh I like how that sounds like it's worth it it's worth the wait and again it's just like that habit and when one person gets it people catch on and then I have a couple people that were like partners and so they practice with each other and I was like blown away with how fast they learned it um and then they asked me clarifying questions along the way or took notes and like hey, this is how you do it so those are kind of things that I think are like that's active allyship not the pronoun slap pins and then can't talk about me conversation that's not allyship um that's like very passive ally it's, it's acceptance um but not like really empowering like my visibility and then i mentioned earlier again just checking in um so many times like this happens on a daily basis but and nobody comes and talks to you about it or says like hey i know this happened or maybe they don't know i don't know um but like you know just meant, like you saw this happen it's not cool um and how can we make it better um is really important and then these are some <clears throat> resources. The first, uh, the first website is the only one I found that actually allows you to put in every type of grammar of a pronoun um, for a set of pronouns and then practice sentences with them. And I think the sentences honestly are a little bit too weird for my liking. Like 
there, but I think it's meant to like practice a pronoun as opposed to like, I don't know, make some assumptions or whatever. Um, but other, there are a lot of books out there that you can practice pronouns. Like again, this is like something to help read it out and make it more fluent. Um, but since I like, I haven't found a lot of websites that have the pre-programmed C's, ears, ears, a lot of you can see here, ears. Um, this one is nice because you can put it in every single form. So I've sent a screenshot to some of my doctor advisors and be like, here, this is what you plug into that and you can practice that. I don't know if they actually did it or not. But the second link, you can, um, I guess, the top word, but um, I think next year would be great if we like gave, if not a hard copy of this, a digital, it's a digital copy for free online, University of Louisville School of Medicine. I actually met um, these people that created this curriculum at the um, L National LGBT Conference in um, North at Northwestern this past summer. And this, I was reading through it. I'm like, this talks about a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about that I don't think is as publicized as it needs to be. So this is a great, like, condensed, like, starting point for, like, improving this kind of curriculum on these nuanced topics. <clears throat> and that reminds me, like, one point I'll add to is that probably this conference is the only place I've been in that I have felt comfortable telling every single person I meet what my pronouns are and then, like, having them share the pronouns with me. And that reminded me of, like, huh, why is this so different? It's because like, I know I'm not gonna be at like, you know, attacked or berated or questioned like, or question my identity, like when I have these conversations and it was so freeing. And that like shows that asking for pronouns are only the half of it. You will not get the answers you're actually looking for and create the safety that you want, unless you have the other half of it, which is like creating that space of inclusivity, safety. And again, it's hard in medicine where our medicine culture, what we're trying to do, it's not there yet. Like you were kind of alone in that. Um, but like, again, speaking to this, like how can you best do that with the tools that you have? And then having these conversations is super important. And then another thing too, like a lot of this has been, you know, we share personal experiences and I want to try and create this and make this something that well, it's hard if, like, to put this in LG, like you're not going to get this kind of conversation with somebody who doesn't have any lived experience. So um, ways to kind of also not necessarily with you all, but if you know people that have never even met a trans person, right? That meeting somebody and having somebody connected to that you can learn from already makes you a better ally than somebody who has no experience working with trans people. And so the ways that you can help people that have never had this exposure, because that was another barrier to the time before, I just haven't met any trans people, so I don't really know what to do about this. Um, these last two articles are just two of, there aren't actually that many, but like two of probably several good ones um, that talks about the first one is actually medical students and or residents, um, actually just residents, um, and how they, their experience is being trans on binary in residency and whether or not they want to come out. Like reading those experiences even was like useful for me. The second one was about LGBT youth talking about personal gender pronouns. Those concepts might seem basic to some people, but a lot of what's nuanced. And you're like, holy cow, like they don't even know why this is an important topic. So giving them the resources to read this stuff and hear from other people's personal experience without actually having to meet anybody is a great first step. Because I think, I think a lot of the times I hear people like, oh, I don't get what the point is. And like they just don't understand. Even my mom didn't understand why I needed to be addressed this way and what that means for me. And like again, a very basic comparison is like names and stuff. Tell you my name's Jody, they're gonna call me Bill. Like that seems bizarre. Like I told you what my name is. Like pronouns are just an extension of your name, and a lot of people don't understand that. Um and yeah, I think that's that's have. It's kind of a harsh ending, but <laughs> I'm surprised I usually run over. So I probably talk way too fast. There's the QR code for feedback if you would so I'd like to give any. And I take any question, any other question. And my email's there. Please email me with any questions you might. Um, I'm curious if there's a experience you've had like on a rotation or a clinic or shadowing or anything like that where you felt like pronoun usage has been done very well and like just in terms of surrounding ourselves with people who do do it well if there's like things you'd recommend to other that's a good question and i'd say probably the closest i've gotten to like and again it wasn't really even just pronouns but i think it was um just the inclusivity of that conversation with my family vacation at riverside there uh, it was something else like it just i i heard my um like it's my physician advisors connect to OSU there before I even arrived sent an email to all the attendings uh, and residents, like basically saying like, these are my pronouns that I was joining like the service for the month. And so people, I didn't realize until after the fact, people had a, a no already that I used their pronouns. They were much more proactive about 
you know, asking me how I wanted to be addressed. And then I think, um, and they always ask me to, like, always ask them, like, because I've had, I actually, luckily, Diana Vayner was great and paired me with a LP preceptor that was primarily working with um, HIV patients and gay patients, and he was gay himself, and he was great about using my pronouns with patients once he started learning them, and he asked me, though, like, do you want me to use your pronouns? A lot of physicians, it's not a lot, but, like, some physicians that they start this conversation will ask me, do I want my pronouns to be used? Um, and typically, I'll say yes, or I'll be I'll, like, you can use he, him as well, um, and I think, I think the best, like, again, asking those questions is, like, the bare minimum, and people don't do it. So if you start doing that, get people thinking, you know, and if they are met with confusion, because it is hard. I think I actually had a, uh, a Toski case one time where I was early on that I asked, like, <coughs> I think I, I said, I, I asked her what her pronouns were, and she was confused, or maybe I said my own pronouns, and, like, she didn't know what pronouns were, which is, like, fair. When I was in college, I didn't know what pronouns were. I was like, what is this? She, she her, I guess, and then two years later, I was not buying it. I was like, what? <laughs> so it's like, you just waste on your exposure what you don't and don't know. Um, um, it's a conversation. And so like with her, I was like, oh, like I use easier pronouns like she, her, like examples, that kind of thing. And then even recognize that people don't maybe even associate it's easier with non-binary. And that's the step back I've had to take too of like, you know, it's so hard to say so many things in a short little time. Um, pick what you want to say and then let them ponder on the rest. Um, but another example too is I had an attending, I think for one two week rotation where I knew I was going to be the only med student, I went by Joey for two weeks. So I wanted to see if my name was what was contributing to using she, her pronouns more. Um, and nobody used she, her pronouns the whole two weeks, which I thought was cool. And then they started to use he, him. Now, by that point, I had been putting he, him on my email signature because I want people to see the correct grammar of it. Um, so I'm like, that's fine. But at the last day, I told the attendees, like, hey, by the way, I'm on my He's like, yeah, I know. And he's like, but you like to be referred to using he, him pronouns of patients, right? And I was like, well, yeah, but like, where did you get this assumption from? Like, you never even asked me. So I thought that was really interesting. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't a super extended conversation, but I love the attendings that you could just have these kind of conversations with and they don't shut down. They just get all like, nah, because it's nuanced or enlightening. And it's just like, I keep wanting to hear what, what I see people think, you know, that they're like, okay, I'm gonna do this or whatever. So I hope that answers your question with a lot of different stories. Um, Thank you. Cool, yeah, yeah. Um, I really liked your research project and I'm glad that, like I thought it was so interesting, glad that you got such an amazing response from it. Um, yeah. What are some, I know you're like, obviously going to residency and stuff, but what are some future research that you want to build off this with? Totally. I think, I remember when I first started making this survey, I had like 30 questions <laughs> and Michael Yeager is helping me with this too. And he was like, for a free survey, 10 questions at the max. Yeah. Like, wow. So we're like, we started from the scratch, got a lot of stuff. There's like two parts because we have the manuscript with the fishbone diagram, but then we have a brief report, which actually has a lot of significant findings on the Likert's questions. So I think I'd want to expand those questions. Okay. Like these comparisons between how people feel about comfort using patient pronouns versus colleague pronouns, there's a significant difference. Like people are more comfortable using their colleagues' pronouns versus patients. There's a little bit of a power dynamic. You don't really know as much. You feel maybe more casual setting, like, or they just haven't met a lot of trans colleagues as opposed so like trans patients seem to be the only time they need a trans person so does that make it more uncomfortable um i want to ask what like what do they see are ways that can make them feel more safe practicing it because i think those are other things that we would want to like implement into like education i know that I was, so it's interesting like when i'm writing this i really want to put interventions in my manuscript but then i was like that wasn't really our study um so a follow-up would be analyzing i guess doing a research on this talk um, and then seeing, do people feel more, I guess, prepared after or before that? Um, and then longitudinal, like everything needs to be longitudinal, figuring out a way to this training, not just a one-time topic and then make it like forever and ever. I think in residency, it would be interesting, like, I'm gonna probably give this talk to my full residents wherever I go. And then honestly, then trying to like, the, you know, the next step is I actually got feedback on our survey of not including faculty that were PhDs, um, and like they have, and especially like working in the college of medicine too, they have a lot of feedback on it too to give, and they were ineligible for the survey. So I was like, I'm so sorry. Like, this, uh, so it's just like a learning process. Like, of course, we want to get, we want to see are like, the barriers different for nursing students versus med students, healthcare uh, uh, affiliated, uh, the staff. A lot of it was like, well, it's like, <laughs> um, and then <clears throat> like. PT, like especially in my interviews with this like if the doctors use it, I thought a lot of times like, well, the residents are using it, but then like the nurses don't, or like, you know, the staff ancillary don't do that. So 
it's like only a bubble of it. So how can we keep branching that out into all the healthcare specialties? And this works in any field, really. But like again, if this is so interdisciplinary, like once you hand them off, are they going to be treated for by somebody else? So those would be a lot of nice steps. Cool. Really interesting. Thank you so much for coming.